good morning, everyone. Thank you for waiting a couple of minutes. Um, we'll be starting now. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is going to be the first in our series about microservices and modern architectures. So this is the first of a series of sessions that we will be uh, providing in partnership with Kong. Today, I have the pleasure to, we have the pleasure to host my good friend, Claudio Wacoviva. He, well, he's been in this industry for a long time, 20 years, working with um, companies and helping develop their service architecture. And well, currently he's working at, as a solution architect at Kong Incorporated, where he helps um, companies modernize their stacks and you know move into the cloud using modern architectures. Um, at Opus, we have been working together with Kong, helping companies, um, you know, um, with their technology decisions and moving their solutions to more modern stacks and modern architectures. So that's a bit of what we'll be covering today. Today is a more of an introductory session. We'll give you, you guys an overview of uh, microservices, uh, service meshes, Kubernetes. Um, how can you migrate towards these technologies and if, if it even makes sense for your organizations to do so and what trade-offs and you know, what does, uh, does it all imply? I'll be taking questions through our Q&A. So at the end, we're gonna have 15 minutes or so to answer questions. So feel free to uh, use the Q&A tool to drop questions and I'll be uh, uh, following up with them by the end. Don't forget, by the end of the talk, we, there will be a draw for two books from O'Reilly, Monolith to Microservices and Kubernetes Up and Running, two great books that we recommend for anyone that's trying to get into these technologies. So without further ado, Claudio, take it away. Yeah, thank you very much, Alex. Thanks for the opportunity and good, good morning, everyone. Yeah, my name is Claudio Poliva and uh, as Alex uh, said, I work as a um, solution architect at Kong for um, one year and a half now. Some people call me cloud.io because of cloud computing and the IO domain, but that's another story, right? So. Uh, Anyway, so yeah, uh, again, thanks everyone for attending the, the webinar. Thank you so much. And uh, for, so for today, I have prepared an agenda with three topics. Number one, the migration process from monoliths to microservices. The second one, uh, the CI CD process that uh, we usually have aligned with the migration itself. And the third, uh, some reference architectures for modern application implementation, having Kubernetes as the platform. So uh, let's get it started with the first one, the migration process. So our story begins uh, with the uh, monolith architecture and uh, the way companies uh, developed applications back there uh, during late 90s and early 2000s. And uh, after a while, applying the service oriented orientation um, principles and uh, ESB products, the, the, the famous or infamous ESB products, Enterprise Service Bus products, uh, we realized that, uh, first of all, the service orientation principles are indeed a very good approach for application development. On the other hand, uh, its implementation using ESB, ESB's products uh, had a, a server, serious problems. First of all, the footprint in terms of servers, in terms of disks, memory, and so on, and so on and so forth, very, usually very, very big. Hard to maintain, hard to evolve, hard to address, new business and technology requirements like mobility, like voice, tablets, and so on. Second, second of all, very rigid in terms of technology options or choices. As a matter of fact, your architecture is tot was totally driven by the ESB vendor. So if you wanted to use a, a technology, a brand new technology, you have to wait for a brand new version provided by these ESB vendors. And the uh, third one, because all this, usually the, the development process 
uh, was not uh, wasn't not so flexible, uh, you know, very very rigid as well. So then we had the uh, the microservice phenomenon. In this sense, each microservice is supposed to be developed by its own development team with its own uh, technology stack in terms of programming language, uh, frameworks, database. Each microservice is supposed to be uh, is supposed to have its own development time frame and so on and so forth. So in this sense, first of all, much more flexible in terms of technology. So for instance, microservice number one is going to use um, a uh, specific programming language like Python, for instance, and it's going to use a, a NoSQL database. Nothing to do with the microservice number two, for instance, for uh, going to use a, a Java application server, if you will, and um, relational database. So you you have this sense, we have this flexibility in terms of uh, technology decisions. Second of all, because of each microservice or each group of microservices is, suppo uh, is supposed to be uh, developed by its own development team, you're going to have a much more, much, much more flexible development processes. And because of this, the footprint um, usually much smaller than the one we, uh, we had at the ESB time. Another way to see the same thing and uh, looking at that diagram like this, on your left, you've got a typical monolith application development. You know, two things here. Number one, using all the services uh, implemented and running in a single ESB product. And second of all, using exactly the same database. And by the way, usually a very big database infrastructure big and expensive database infrastructure. On your right, you got the microservices approach. So instead of having a single engine, uh, we're gonna have multiple engines, each one of them responsible for a specific microservice or a collection of microservices, if you will. And again, having its own technology stack, using its own database technology and so on and so forth. If uh, the microservice phenomenon uh, solves a lot of problems we had. Uh, it brings other ones, new ones, let's say. For instance, a very, it's a very, very valid question would be, uh, how do I identify my microservices? It's a very, very good question. It's a very valid question again. So if you take a look at this diagram over here, we see some context, this functional context, the sales context and the support to context. Pretty much straightforward, nothing special on this. Very easy to imagine that uh, you, your organization, got, uh, has got a, a serve sales organization, sa and, then, and therefore uh, microservice, sales-oriented microservices uh, inside of it. The same thing for support. But to be honest, uh, corporation, corporations, generally speaking, much more complex than this. So... What, what are my contexts? And therefore, what are my microservices uh, running inside of these, these, each one of these contexts? Because of this, it's highly recommended to have some kind of support in terms of uh, Microsoft identification, to help you out with these Microsoft identification for it. That's where these uh, methodologies, specifically, specifically the domain-driven design methodology, the DDD, comes in, very, very important. To, again, to help you out, first of all, to define or to identify your functional contexts and therefore, and therefore to help you out with uh, uh, these microservices identification. On your right, you got a very, very good book written by Eric Evans with a foreword by Martin Fowler, two very good references in terms of for application development and uh, of course, microservices as well. I, again, I strongly recommend you uh, at least to take a look at this book. Uh, another perspective to, um, to think about is a kind of strategy uh, to, to help you out from, you know, again, from migrate, uh, for, to migrate from your mi monolith infrastructure to microservices. Um, generally speaking, we got these three main strategies. On your left, you got the first one is called the strangler. 
So in this strangler strategy, we got this brand new layer. We call this layer strangler facade. It's a brand new layer running on top of your ESB or current infra infrastructure for our services. And of course, running on top of your microservices architecture. The consumers uh, is supposed to consume only the facade and they don't know anything about it, about the process, the migration process that's happening uh, behind the scenes. So in this sense, over time, you're gonna, you're gonna start to uh, develop uh, brand new microservices and retiring the current services running inside your ESB infrastructure. And over time, again, your microservices is gonna grow with a brand new microservices running inside of it. And then of course, there's no impact uh, to your consumers. The second one in the middle, we call it the splitting services. And in this case, the ESB is being consumed by your consumers. And then it's gonna be uh, like this, because uh, in this case, uh, we're gonna have your microservices running behind your ESB. And again, over time, you're gonna start to shrink your ESB infrastructure and start to replacing your services by proxies this time. And these proxies are gonna call uh, your microservices architecture, your brand new microservices running your brand new uh, infrastructure. And your right, you're gonna the, the third strategy, we call it extracting services. This time we're gonna have two completely separate infrastructures. Uh, the current one, of course, your ESB infrastructure being exposed as usual to your consumers and the brand new infrastructure, again, uh, based on microservices technologies and philosophy. This time, maybe you're gonna have your ESB being consumed by your traditional channels, like for instance, CRM applications or call center applications. And then the brand new digital channels like voice or mobility and so on and so forth, um, they're gonna consume your microservices instead of your, instead of your ESB services. Uh, just another reference for the facade uh, strategy. Here's a reference architecture. And then uh, up there, we got the, uh, what we call the edge computing layer typically running two main products, the API gateway and the identity provider. The identity provider is a um, uh, layer responsible for typically security tasks like user and uh, application authentication, uh, token issuing, uh, two-factor or maybe multi-factor authentication and so on and so forth. And then of course the API gateway responsible for a uh, very important task, first of all, to protect your digital assets from the, uh, the, um, the requests coming from the outside and applying policies like throttling or rate limiting, if you will, caching, and of course, routing your requests to uh, the current enterprise FC bus on your left or routing the same request to the microservices, the brand new infrastructure you are developing. If we, if we zoom in uh, our Microsoft's box, you're gonna see, you're gonna start to see some uh, more specific components and layers. As a matter of fact, I, I, I took this diagram from a very good paper written by Eric Nipp and others from Gartner. Again, I strongly recommend to at least, it was written back there in 2016. I strongly recommend at least to take a look at this paper. And uh, you're gonna see in this paper that uh, the authors uh, define two layers of architecture. Number one, the outer architecture, and then the inner architecture. Of course, the outer architecture is responsible for, uh, let's say, defining a cradle for your microservices. So something like, doesn't matter how many microservices you're gonna have, each one of them uh, will have to have an API gateway to protect themselves from the requests coming from the outside. Each one of these microservices is gonna have, will have to have my, uh, message channels in order to communicate to, uh, to each other. 
and so on and so forth. So the Alder architecture is responsible for defining these basic and low level uh, service, uh, infrastructure services to be used by the microservices. And of course, uh, we got the inner, inner architecture. The inner architecture is responsible for uh, defining the internal architecture for each one of these microservices. Again, what are, you, what are the services component for each one of them? Database, they're gonna use it and so on and so forth. So again, uh, very, very good white paper, at least to take a look at it. Another thing to keep in mind when we're talking about microservices is that uh, by definition, very, very important thing, uh, by definition, microservices are uh, distributed and dynamic environment. Like this diagram over here. So we got a microservice one, it's calling microservice two. Very easy. But there's a, a detail here. Uh, we got a, a micro, a multiple instances of microservice two. And uh, that will be, uh, you know, uh, I would say uh, you're gonna have this kind of situation all the time when dealing with the microservices. So every time a microservice one wants to call microservice two, there's a problem here. We got three instances of microservice two. So it's up to the microservice one to solve problems like uh, load balancing and health checks maybe defining an encrypted channel in order to have a uh, secure channel communication with microservice two and so on and so forth. Not so easy code to write. I would say very complex uh, code to write. And more than that, that will be a waste of time and money to have your microservice development team to write code like this. Instead of focusing on the business logic, your development team will be implemented these, again, not so easy code to write and to debug and to deploy and so on and so forth. So um, how to solve this kind of thing? There, there are, there's uh, some um, uh, solutions in order to address this kind of problem. Uh, the one that I like most is that uh, when we have a uh, uh, external component, when we try to compile or to, or to, ex or to externalize all, all these functionalities uh, into this component. So we call this component the proxy. So again, every time a microservice one needs to call microservice two, it doesn't know the microservice one doesn't know that uh, we got three instances of microservice run, uh, running at this time. As a matter of fact, it's part of the proxy responsibility, responsibility to, to deal with this kind of problem, uh, situation, let's say. So again, the request is going through the proxy and the proxy will be responsible for, first of all, to load balance and therefore to create a uh, encrypted channel or maybe have checks to, to just to make sure that the instance number three is up and running correctly and so on and so forth. Um, a, a solution like this, uh, with a solution like this, microservice one uh, will be responsible only for the business logic. All these non-business logic will be uh, addressed, implemented by these proxies. As a matter of fact, this is the philosophy of this emerging uh, design pattern. We call it service mesh design pattern. So this, this, the service mesh is all about this. Define, first of all, defines two main layers. Number one, the proxy. There are the names, names for the proxy. Um, we call it, usually we call it data plane or sidecars. So uh, for each one of your microservices, you're gonna have a, a specific sidecar uh, working very close to it. And for each one of the requests coming in or coming, um, coming out of this uh, microservice, you're gonna be intercepted by the sidecar and the sidecar, of course, again, will apply these load balancing policies, these encrypted channel policies, uh, um, health check policies and so on and so forth. And then we got a second layer we call it a control plane. 
the control plane responsible for defining policies and broadcasting and publishing these policies over the sidecars we have in our, our microservice or service mesh uh, implementation. So let's say, for instance, uh, the control plane says right now that uh, the microservice one and microservice two have to communicate using an encrypted channel. That's part of the control plane. This is a control plane decision. And then the control plane, again, is going to publish this kind of policy to the sidecars. And the sidecars uh, is going to take care of it, implementing this encrypted channel in order to have a uh, um, encrypted communication between these two microservices. If we move forward and try to um, uh, evolve our reference architecture for our microservices, we're going to have something like this. Again, uh, in brown, you're going to have your own microservices, as usual, and the orange boxes representing the SART cars. Again, for each one of your microservices, you're going to have a specific SART car. And again, each one of these SART cars will be responsible for uh, these known business, business, business logics like, again, uh, traffic control, load balancers, secret breakers, and so on and so forth. And of course, we have this control plane in order to, uh, to manage these policies um, published over the sidecars. That concludes the, the first part of the web, webinar. I'd like to move forward and go to the second one, which is um, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the CI CD process or continuous integration and continuous delivery. So this time, uh, my story begins with a very, very simple question. That is, why do companies look for CI CD or buy CI CD uh, technologies, tooling, products, and so on? Why? To put it simply, uh, maybe you want to have a faster time to market, or maybe you want to ship more re reliably and more often uh, your new products. In summary, you want to compete better in the marketplace. So uh, on the other hand, just like anything else in computer science, CICD is, is a philosophy uh, combining operating principles, processes, and tooling. And uh, of course, again, uh, just like anything else in computer design, it's highly recommended to have a plan to implement a process and to have an evolving process. Try to avoid, trying to avoid a CI CD Big Bang implementation. Just to give an idea, that's a um, a typical CI CD process or pipeline, if you will. So first of all, it's highly recommended to, uh, to implement these, uh, what we call the API first implementation process. So before starting, start, starting coding or microservices, that will be uh, necessary to define the interfaces, the APIs, and therefore, based on your APIs, you start writing your microservices because all these that will be very, very good to have this kind of, uh, kind of tooling of, uh, for API specification editor. For instance, we got uh, several options in the marketplace right now. For instance, Kong has got its own, it's called it Kong Studio. And uh, Kong Studio, again, is a API specification editor, totally based on these uh, Swagger specification standard, open API specification standard, and, uh, in, in, and again, Kong Studio is responsible for basic tasks like uh, syntax checkings and so on. But uh, other uh, very, very important capabilities is to integrate your uh, editor with your CI CD products or pipelines in the background. The first integration pro uh, point that will be integrating your Kong Studio editor with your repository or API repository uh, implemented with uh, using GitHub, for instance. So in this sense, we're gonna have a, a team development environment. So all your APIs will be stored in your GitHub repository. So in this sense, 
you won't have any local API specification stored in your development laptops, for instance. More than that, because you're using GitHub, maybe GitHub is responsible for firing your CI CD process in the background. And then, of course, integrating your pipeline management infrastructure, for instance, based on Jenkins or Jenkins X for Kubernetes, Ansible for um, provisioning, JUnit for testing, and so on. And of course, at the end of the process, you're going to have deployments uh, against your de deployment environments, not just the API in themselves, but of course, the microservices also. Uh, your deployment, for instance, running in, in Docker or Kubernetes, as you wish. Uh, we can talk about CI/CD uh, philosophy from you know different perspectives. Here's a uh, just a uh, uh, recommendation. Uh, we got five perspectives, and uh, of course we can uh, bring uh, the sixth one and uh, other perspectives as you wish. But you know, again, just a starting point. Five perspectives we can talk about CI/CD. Number one is a uh, the source code perspective. So uh, at least you have a uh, source code management system in order, first of all, to restore your source code and then to control the changes, all the changes you got in your, in your source code application. And uh, of course, environments, very, very important perspective. So highly recommended to have multiple environments, let's say testing environment, uh, certification environment, pre-production, production environments, and so forth. And then, of course, um, having a uh, kind of some kind of promotion uh, process in the background implemented again with your CI/CD tools. Needless to say, that testing is very, very important perspective. So just to make sure that you you are deploying uh, very robust code and APIs into your uh, the deployment environments. Uh, the, the, the new versions of your microservices or new versions of your API. Tooling. Again, um, I strongly recommend to have the evolving process in terms of tooling. Again, first of all, to start with the uh, very basic source code management system like GitHub, for instance, or GitLab, and then start to include other tools like pipeline management, Ansible, Chef, Terraform, whatever you want. J unit for testing and so on. And I would say the last one, the pipeline management, uh, I would say the, uh, that that would be the most important perspective, not just to manage the CI CD process you got, but to identify possible bottlenecks and of course, creating a specific security models for your DevOps teams and developers and production guys and so on and so forth. So uh, that concludes the second part of the, uh, the webinar. And uh, the last one is the, I'd like to talk a little bit about the reference architecture totally ba based on Kubernetes. So this, uh, my story this time begins with a very, very basic edge computing reference architecture. So again, we got an API gateway responsible for securing your applications, your infrastructure uh, from the uh, requests coming from the outside, working very closely to the identity provider. Again, responsible for authentication, token issue, and so, forth, so on and so forth. Very basic, nothing special on this. But on the other hand, uh, taking a look at a diagram like this, uh, we start thinking about who is taking care of non-functional capabilities, non-functional requirements, like for instance, um, high availability, scalability, or elasticity, if you will. Who's taking care of it? As a matter of fact, nobody is taking care of it. Looking at a diagram like this. Of course, the marketplace offers you uh, several options to implement these non-functional capabilities. For instance, if you go to Microsoft, you're going, possibly you're gonna use their service fabric infrastructure. If you go to Amazon, 
maybe going to use EC2s and alt scaling groups or ECS. But this time we have a very nice uh, option, which is Kubernetes. It's getting traction in the marketplace right now. And why is that? Why are people, why are companies going to uh, Kubernetes? Because it's cool. It is cool, by the way. It is very, very cool. But not because it's cool. Because it really brings very, very valuable um, capabilities to your infrastructure. First of all, all the other uh, options I had described before, uh, they, they are all proprietary options. So if you decide to go to Microsoft and use Sassy Fabric, it's gonna run only in Azure, only with Microsoft, Microsoft um, technology, so on and so forth. Same thing applies to Google's or AWS and so on and so forth. That doesn't happen with the Kubernetes. So Kubernetes, the first value that brings to us is a kind of, we got a, a standardized environment. So it doesn't matter where you're going, if you go into AWS with the EKS, if you go into Microsoft to AKS, or VMware with PKS, or MidiCube for laptops, you're gonna have Kubernetes. So all your environment, all your configuration, all your deployments, they're gonna be exactly the same. Again, doesn't matter where you're going. Open shift by Red Hat and so on and so forth. That's a very, very important capability, very, very important value to consider when choosing your infrastructure for your microservices. Uh, other nice capability on your left, you can see very nice capabilities provided by Kubernetes. I would say the first one, uh, the, I would say the self-healing response, working at the, the pod, and by the way, the Kubernetes pod is where your microservice is running in, inside so every time a pod goes down, or in my case, every time my API gateway goes down, the Kubernetes, more precisely, the self-healing capability is gonna take care of it and bring this pod up again. Uh, another capability is called HPA. HPA stands for Horizontal Pod Outscaler. So HPA is responsible for the elasticity of your cluster. So the number, that means that the number of the, the, the number of the instances of my gateway is going up or down, depending on the traffic, depending on the number of requests that are coming in. So if, you, if I have a high throughput right now, maybe three pods are not enough. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna need five pods, for instance. And then when the throughput, when the throughput goes down, I can shrink the number of pods for two or maybe three pods, and that would be more than enough. And finally, the load balance, of course, the, uh, we got this notion of Kubernetes servers, service, and service is responsible for the load balancing um, uh, of your requests that come in, um, and load balancing the requests over the pods you got uh, running inside the cluster. That will be, um, one possibility using Kubernetes. And then, uh, as a matter of fact, we have moved forward into this uh, infrastructure. Uh, there's another topology that is getting traction and specifically for the API gateway. Again, applying this, uh, this control plane and data plane philosophy. And this time, for instance, we got a single data plane responsible for the administration tasks. So every time you want to define a new API, or to change the rate limiting policy for a given API, you go to the control plane. So the control plane, again, responsible for the administration tasks only. And then you're gonna have multiple data planes all over your environment you have in your corporate environment. The point here is that uh, the data planes, they have to follow uh, all the places you, your microservices are. So if you have microservices running on-premise, for instance, 
using a typical Red Hat Enterprise Linux, you're gonna have data planes running on premises also. The same thing applies for your microservices running on the cloud. You're gonna have data planes running on the cloud as well. So that's what we call the hybrid cloud deployment for your uh, API gateway layer or your edge computing layer. It's uh, important to notice that uh, physically speaking, we're talking about several instances, but logically speaking, we're talking about a single API gateway cluster. Again, from the consumer perspective, they're just, they're, they just see a, one single API gateway. That's for the edge computing layer. But then we got, and then of course, we don't have any code running typically. We don't have any code running uh, inside your edge computing layer. Your code, your microservices are running a totally separated cluster, maybe another Kubernetes cluster. And then there will be an, uh, a nice, uh, a good approach to have a specific uh, layer to protect your microservices running inside these specific Kubernetes cluster. Something like, uh, I don't care what's happening up there if the uh, consumer is going to the identity provider to get authenticated using this or that authentication process, I don't care. Uh, but on the other hand, every, if you want to consume my microservices, you have to have an API key just because. Something like an extra security uh, layer specifically for your microservices cluster. And then that's why we got another layer inside your, your Kubernetes cluster. In Kubernetes terms, we call this layer, Kubernetes calls it as a Kubernetes ingress controller. That is controller controlling the ingresses that coming in um, uh, into your Kubernetes cluster. So in this sense, your left, the edge computing layer will be responsible for uh, high level, coarse grain policies, like a global rate limiting policy, user in application authentication and so on and so forth. And then in the second uh, Kubernetes cluster, you're gonna have a fine grain, low level, specific microservice policies. For instance, a specific rate limiting or a specific security policy uh, for your microservices. That will be the second level abstraction for your architecture in terms of security, in terms of um, microservice implementation. And then we got the third and the last level abstraction, bringing the concept of the self mesh we talked, um, we talked before, and uh, to take care of the microservice to microservice communication. So every time you have a, a microservice to microservice communication, that will be a nice idea to have the service mesh implementation to take care of not just of your load balancing policy or your canary, for instance, you got a, a current the, uh, microservice to, for instance, you got a, a microservice current implementation, but then you decided to implement a brand new, a slightly different release for this microservice. And then you want to control the traffic over here 5% of the traffic is going to this canary release, 95% um, are going uh, as usual for the current Microsoft 2 uh, version or release. So that will be the, the third level of abstraction. Again, for the self mesh implementation, we got several options in the marketplace right now. And I'm just presenting you uh, the Kong uh, option for you. That's another project. It's called Kuma. Uh, if you want to take a look, the website is kuma.io. Again, you can check the, the, you can download it, you can check the, the documentation and you to implement it and so on and so forth. That will be an uh, invitation for you. And then uh, that will be the third level of abstraction. Number one, so in summary, number one, the edge computing. Number two, the English control, the Kubernetes English controller. And number three, the SAM smash taking care of the microservice to microservice communication process. 
So uh, that concludes our, our, uh, our webinar. I think it's time for questions, right, Alex? Yes, yes, I do have a couple of questions for you, Claudio. Um, if we can start, since we were just talking about canneries, um, some maybe a more specific question. Um, how do I know if a cannery release is good for production or not? What sort of metrics should I look at or what are the criteria for that? Yeah, yeah. The thing is, canary uh, is a kind of approach for you know. Uh, as I said before, you you got uh, your current releases for your microservices, and then uh, you're thinking about the evolution for your microservices, and then of course you know after even going through a very rigid DevOps or CI/CD pipeline, you want to be more careful in terms of you know deploying this ver this brand new. Uh, release for your microservices. We call it can canary. Uh, we, the canary is an analogy. Uh, usually, you know, uh, it came from the miners. Every time the miners went, uh, got into a mine, they usually carry on with, uh, carry some canaries. Uh, if the canary dies, uh, it means that the, the oxygen inside the mine is not that healthy. So uh, it's time to, uh, to, uh, to run away because they are right. not so healthy environment. So it's kind of an analogy for your microservices. So uh, it's time to roll back. yes, some, something like that. So uh, let's say you want to control the traffic. As I said before, let's deploy this brand new release for my microservice, but I like to control the traffic. So something like 2%, 5% of the traffic is going to the canary. And then of course, I'll have to have some kind of monitoring infrastructure to take care of it to analyze what's going on with canary and so on and so forth. And then over time, you start to, uh, to increase the, the percentage of the, the requests that go into the canary. And then over time, of course, the canary can be promoted to the, the current release. And then you can retire the current release and, um, and um, you know, uh, simp simply you know, remove the current release out of your Microsoft environment. That will be it. So usually uh, the canary release, uh, usually we have a very, very uh, uh, strong monitoring uh, system, you know, again, to uh, pay attention uh, about the canary behavior. Uh, if, it, if it's, uh, you know, running properly, uh, with the kind of the, the, the code is really robust in terms of uh, performance, in terms of um, scalability and so on and so forth. And uh, that will be it. Okay. Uh, one more question. Um, if I were to start a project today, um, should, uh, what would be the trade-offs or, you know, the um, overheads that I should look into if, in, when deciding to go with microservices or starting with a monolith? Yeah, I would say it's a very good question. I would say that, you know, instead of, you know, starting spending a dollars with, uh, for instance, uh, uh, Docker or even Kubernetes, I would start, you know, uh, with, uh, as I said before, with methodologies like DDD. Uh, instead of, you know, starting uh, writing code, writing your microservice code, it's kind of, you know, highly recommended to, to have some kind of methodology First of all, to identify your functional contexts inside right. your organization. And therefore, of course, to identify your microservices and therefore start writing code. So that would be it. I mean, uh, uh, it's a very, um, I would say very, very common recommendation for not just for microservices, for any other technology you might uh, think about. The same thing applies for Kubernetes. A kind of, you know, Kubernetes is not a, an easy platform to deal with. As a matter of fact, is it becoming a de facto, Kubernetes is becoming a de facto standard in the marketplace, but it's not easy. So uh, I would say that if, you, if you're willing to deploy your microservices using Kubernetes, uh, yes, uh, my recommendation is uh, go for it, but maybe if it's too much for you, maybe it's time to start with a Docker container first and then that will be a natural evolution to Kubernetes. 
because you know you get you're, you're more familiar with these container technologies and so on and so forth so uh when the right time comes you're ready to go to a more um a little bit more complex environment like kubernetes that would be okay it. so uh following on the same line of questioning um how about the service mesh how what when do you um, realize, hey, it's, it's no, maybe I should start implementing a service mesh here. It's a very good question. And, and I, I can tell my, my own experience. It's very, very common. You go to a customer, a customer goes like, you know, I got a microservice project in place right now. And I go like, oh, nice, very good. And I ask something like, um, how many microservices you got? Let's say 30 microservices. And I go like, uh, given, let's say, uh, let's say a microservice number seven, how many instances you've got uh, for these specific microservice? Usually the response is like, uh, what do you mean by that? As a matter of fact, you know, it's very, very easy. The thing is very, very easy. Uh, companies starting with a microservice project but as a matter of fact, it's not a real microservice. It's kind of still, you still have monoliths wrapped up with a, you know, uh, uh, new technologies. So you still have monoliths wrapped it up with, as a containers running as pod in Kubernetes. So in this sense, in an environment like this, number one, uh, maybe it's time to review your microservice um, identification and designing process and therefore to keep in mind that you know again by definition it's very very positive you're gonna have multiple instances of a given microservice positive because of the traffic because this is canary release because you're possibly because your blue green deployments uh several reasons you're gonna have multiple instances of a given microservice right if you don't have it Maybe it's not time for service mesh. It's going to have a much more complex environment to, to manage, to deal with. Maybe service mesh is not, is not for your environment right now. So service right. mesh, kind of service mesh is supposed to be used when you have the multiple instances for a given microservice, right? So that would be it. And I'm um, still talking about service meshes. Um, the, how much of an... Uh, of a trade-off is having the, all, all those sidecars running alongside all the microservices? Oh yeah, the, another good question. Uh, yes, of course, there's no free lunch, right? So somebody has to implement this kind of policies, right? This kind of um, uh, requirements, right? So again, load balancing, secret, secret breaker, encrypted channel, and so on, so on and so forth. Somebody has to do it. The point here, is that uh, let's implement all these functionalities into external component and leave the microservices to focus on the business logic only. So again, wouldn't be a good design and it would be a big waste of money and time if we are spending your time, uh, your microservice development team develop this kind of of uh, functionality again secret breaker load balance and so forth so on and so forth but you're right i mean when you inject the sidecar into your microservice architecture of course you are um, uh, requesting some for some more resources in terms of infrastructure in terms of cpu uh, memory disk and so on and so forth of course but again every, uh, somebody has to do it so the point here is not about the costs but you know uh, separation concerns. Let again, let's keep these functionalities uh, uh, in an external component, and let let's leave the microservices microservices to deal with the business logically. That's the uh, that's the objective. All that's right. The goal. One last question. It's a bit of a yeah. an open discussion, and maybe uh, it wouldn't normally lead to a larger discussion, but. Um, we know when comparing all the cloud providers these days, AWS, uh, Google Cloud Platform, Azure, and whatnot, would you say there's a preferred option moving forward? No, very difficult question. I, I, you know, all of them, you know, I, Azure, Microsoft Azure, uh, AWS, Google, even VMware, 
uh, even Alibaba, I know Alibaba is not a reality in Western, but you know, very, very good infrastructure. And all of them, all of them, they got very nice services. And, uh, and of course, when talking about containers, when talking about Kubernetes, all of them, they got Kubernetes service for you. So really depends, really depends on the kind of um, um, implementation or try to achieve and the kind of services you want to use and so on and so forth. It's a very, it's a, I would say a fascinating discussion, but you know, it's not like, it's not like this, you know, uh, go for this cloud vendor or go through to that cloud vendor. All of them very, very good. Um, uh, that would be my answer for it. All right. Um, so I think that about wraps it up for us today. Uh, for those of us who stayed with us, we will have our draw now. So first for our Kubernetes up and running book, uh, the, the winner is Carlos Guarani. We will be contacting you to set up the way to deliver the book for you. And for the book Monolith to Microservices, Tatiwana Imashima. So we will be, I will be sending out emails to you guys so we can set up the delivery. So congrats for that. And finally, I wanted to thank you, Claudio, again for the great lecture. Um, we will be diving deeper in all of these concepts. So uh, look for more invitations from us. We will be having more webinars, especially in these times where everyone's staying safe at home, I hope. We'll be bringing some more good content for everyone. And well, free, feel free to reach out if you have any questions regarding these topics. Uh, we do believe that these are uh, very, very strong tendencies within the industry. Like, like Claudia said, we believe these technologies are becoming the de facto standards and, and they will be the standard for a while still. So um, that's why we believe we're investing in, in, you know, in, in bringing this content. And thank you again for joining us. And Claudio, feel free to add anything if you'd like. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I'd like to thank you very much again, uh, you know, for the opportunity and thank you everybody for, you know, for attending the webinar. Yes, thank you so much. All right, so, uh, oh, one more thing. We will be following up with a short five minute survey, probably tomorrow. So if you guys could just take five minutes to answer that, it would help us a lot bringing you guys the best content that we can and both in terms of topics and formats. So hopefully we'll still meet together in the future. Stay safe and have a good one. Thanks everyone.